the little red dot recording. Cool. God is good. Amen. All the time. All the time. And all the time, God is good. All right. Father, this word is yours, not mine. May you just do what you will. I, I, I don't know what else to do. This passage, this message is probably a hard one. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Go to Isaiah verse 30. Or, no, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 30. We've come across that past three sermons. Verse 21. And whenever you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear this command behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Do you trust him enough to go in a, dire in, in, in a direction where you're like, God, this looks so stupid. How do I know I'm going in the right direction? All right. Go to 1 John 2.27. All right. A lot of jumping here. Just... Stay with me. You're practicing your Bible sword drills. Do you guys remember Bible sword drills? So let's see who. They would have it in Awanas or some other. Oh, yes. And they say, you know, it's like uh, they would give the book chapter reference and uh, who, whoever could get to it the fastest. Yeah. Oh. It says, you know, charge, you know. No, we were losers. Oh, okay. <laughs> this was, uh, I think, in Presbyterian or whatnot. Oh, sure. uh, okay, First John 2.27. The anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Now, I need to stop right there. This is not a license to not Amen. be without teachers per se. Okay? Ephesians 4.12 tells us about... Um, it tells us about that teachers are given for the maturing of the saint. Um... It teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as he has taught you, remain in him. The Spirit of God teaches us where we ought to go, what we ought to do. He provides the teacher for you, be it human or be it seclusion, and it's direct. Okay? So, interestingly, John is talking to, the Lord showed this to me, he's talking to his disciples, because he's referring to them in the end of the book, little children keep yourself from idols. Okay? The disciples of, of a person were, would be children. Okay? Because they are literally your offspring. They're reproducing after your like kind. So, the anointing you receive from him, it could be the anointing of the Holy Spirit, just... You know, where Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. It can be any anointing, but the point is, it's His guiding you. Okay? Uh, John 10. Um, so, I guess what I'm trying to say with that, the Holy Spirit is the one teaching you. Amen. He's the one who guides you. I love what Paul says, For the love of God constrains me, therefore I per we persuade man. You know, it's, it's like walking in the direction, and then you're like, I feel like I'm walking backwards until I go to the direction the Holy Spirit wants me to go. Okay? This is in your daily life, not neglecting all teachers. You know, there's some solid Bible teachers that expound on the Scripture. Leanne was a teacher. That was her gifting. That was her calling. That was also her profession. Where uh, what she did is she would take a piece of Scripture... You know, if, if the fivefold office was equated to the medical community, your apostle was a general practitioner telling you where to go. Your prophet was a surgeon getting the cancer out. You don't like surgeons, but they do their job well. The evangelist says, there's good news for this. We have a cure. Let me tell you what it is. The pastor and shepherd says, okay, let's get you fed, let's get you back up on your feet and recovery. The teacher said, this is good food and here's why this medicine does this and this does that. That's the teacher, okay? From what I've seen with the scripture, 
that teaching in 1 John 2, 27 specifically deals with your daily walk with the Lord. It is impractical to have your very own Bible teacher right there, right next to you with everything you do. I mean, Kathy, how would you like to have, if, if Mike was your teacher, how would you like to have Mike just be with you teaching, you know, as you're in the middle of, of welding something and, and you're like, go away! <laughs> as you're trying to concentrate. See, the Holy Spirit teaches you all things, and it's true. That's what he does. But he's that voice that says, this is the way, walk in it. No, put that tool down, go get this. Okay? As you go along the way, my son, let your gaze be straight before you. Do not turn to the left nor to the right. Proverbs. Okay? John 10. He says this. Uh, let me go to verse 2. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper, or shall we say the Holy Spirit, opens it for him. And the sheep hear his voice. Now, if that doorkeeper, opened, um, if it wasn't the shepherd, that doorkeeper's not going to open it. So the sheep will not go to it. It's the Holy Spirit who quickens you. He called, that's the shepherd, calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. So if you're going somewhere or being led somewhere, the Holy Spirit opens your heart to receive Christ to say, this is where he's going. He goes ahead of you. If he's giving you a direction, follow it. It may sound crazy. Do it. This is a very unusual message. But the Lord is saying to all of us, take risk. Because he knows the way. We sang Waymaker. He, he knows the way. He is the way. And if he went before us, it, it says right here, the shepherd goes, the sheep here recognize his voice and will never follow a stranger. You, if you're convicted of something, you immediately know and say, oh shoot, I shouldn't have done that. Stink, I need to go fix that. I think I... Can I get an amen? Is that, is, that, is that not what happens? That's the Holy Spirit saying, this is the way. That's not the way. That's right. John 10, verse 10. He says, ah, a thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in you, which is the Spirit of Jesus, we regard Jesus no longer in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's to give you life. If, and it's going to un, be uncomfortable in your flesh. You're like, I don't want to do this. And God says, I don't care. I am a gentleman. I won't push you. But uh, it's going to be very uncomfortable unless you listen and do. And you'll know it because you will be so agitated and uncomfortable. So finally you say, I give up. And he's like, great. Now I've got a vessel to work with. Clay, when you uh, have it on a wheel, if it doesn't have water, it just breaks and crumbly. God doesn't want that. He wants to make a fitting vessel for his glory. Okay. Uh, verse 14. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. I know my own sheep. I'm intimately acquainted with my own sheep. I love the scripture. Behold, you are engraven on my hands, and I love you. Look at his hands. He says you're engraven on his hands. As the Father knows me, and I know the Father... I lay down my life for the sheep. So it would be counterproductive for Jesus to do something in your life and take you away to, to a place in, that would cause you harm. Amen. It would be against his nature, against his interest. If you really believe he is your shepherd, then let him do what he wants to do and stop fighting it. Bring your concerns before him. Lord, this is not comfortable. This is not what I want. I hurt for these people. This. And say, but. You're still God. And I trust you. Do with me what you will. Because I know if you love me, it's not in your nature for me to get hurt. 
because he says I'm a good shepherd. I, ha- I will lay down my life for, for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I'm laying down my life, so I'm going to take it up again. It is in God the Father's nature not to lose a sheep. <clears throat> Go to Romans 4. So, uh, oh, thank you, Lord, for children. Thank you, Jesus, for this. Go to verse 16. Am I still recording? Go away. Okay, just you stay there, okay? This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace. Not by anything you do. His grace in you. We live by the faith of the Son of God. It's God's faith, not you. You've been saved by faith. Not yours, His. To guarantee it to all the descendants, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence and that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, that he became the father of many nations. According to what had been spoken, so will your descendants be. He considered his own body to be already dead since he was about 100 years old, and also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb without weakening in faith. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Listen, because he was fully convinced that what he, God, had promised, he was able to perform. Guys, if God is telling you to do something, God is stretching your faith muscle. To get you to believe that he is fully able to perform what he said he's going to do. A a doubtful person is double-minded, unstable in all their ways. Let him never supposed to receive anything from God. That's James. Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, it was credited to him was not written for Abraham alone. Listen, Abraham was the father of it. But also for us, it will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Listen, if you guys believe that Jesus saved you from the dead, is your Lord, all that stuff, why can't you believe that he'll find your car keys and provide your house payment? Why can't you believe? You think a house payment is anything to God? Do you think healing of illness is anything to the Lord? He raised Jesus Christ from the dead when all of hell was against him. So, if, if you believe that he saved you, and that he will raise you up, why do you doubt him? Why? Question. You can bring a concern. You can bring a concern and tell him you're struggling. But at the end, let the very last word say, but God... You're in control. Yes, absolutely wrestle with the Lord. Don't skip the spiritual algebra. Remember in high school you had algebra and you had to show your work? Can't just jump to the problem, uh, jump to the solution? Don't jump to the solution with the Lord. It's like uh, the Sunday school teachers, they say, so uh, once Brown has a fuzzy tail and likes to eat nuts. And one kid... You know, little Johnny raises his hand. He said, well, it sounds like a squirrel. It looks like a squirrel. But the answer always has to be Jesus. <laughs> Don't skip the spiritual algebra. Wrestle with the Lord. Until you get to that place, I won't let you go till you bless me. And that's Abraham where he said, I won't let you go till you bless me. Go to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. I 
I got a phone call. Turn it off or something. Genesis 15. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Folks, I want you to hold on to this. This is very important. Let this be your battle cry. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be great. Boom. Stop there. Reward for what? What was his reward? I mean, uh, excuse me. Reward for what? What was he going to get? Uh, you know, for, for what action on Abraham's part was he going to get? There's going to be a reward. He said, you know what? It all started in the garden. They, the garden started with having the seed, the one who would save them and bring them back to the Lord. Abram said just a little bit ago, rescued Lot from uh, the kings of Sodom. Uh, excuse me, uh, from from Chedor uh, Laomer and and all those kings. The promise was, God, you promised to bring the Messiah. You promised to bring the Deliverer to save us, save us from this wretched condition, so that we are in unity with you. That was his trust. That was the faith he had. He believed in the Messiah. He believed in Jesus, but he didn't see him. He said, I, got, I believe that you're going to come down and you will be with me. No longer side by side, but we will be one. That was the promise. And then he said, but what can you give me, Lord? Since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, Lord, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky, count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. It was all about the seed of God. That possession. I must have God's Seed. I must have that that in there. And Jesus was that seed. He was the seed of Abraham. And that was what he, he was waiting for that promise. Abram believed the Lord, and he, meaning the Lord, credited to him his righteousness. So the faith, the trust comes in the one who calls you. The physical things, Abram rejected, said, I am not, in the previous chapter, I am not going to let him say that I've made Abram rich. Abram didn't want the things of this world. Abram wanted the things of God. Faith is the currency of heaven. Physical things are the currency here. Jesus said, render to Jesus the things that are Caesar's, and the things that are God's belong to God. The matters of the heart, trust, and faith, listening to the Holy Spirit as He guides you. The ultimate goal from the beginning to today is Jesus Christ. Make Him known among all the earth. Does Jesus live in you? Do you believe He's guiding you? Is He taking you to where you need to be? If He's not, you better start asking and seek His face. Because the whole point of the Holy Spirit is to bring you back to Jesus. That's the whole point. The whole point of his voice in you is to make Jesus manifest to you, in you. Paul said, Christ was revealed not to me, but in me. Amen. That is the whole point of the gospel. Christ in you, the mystery of glory, the uh, mystery of godliness, the hope of glory. Guys, does he live in you? Does he constrain you? Is he sanctifying you and stripping you of things that are uh, holding you back from His best. If you don't have His best, you need to seek the face of God. Humbly and say, Lord, I don't, I don't have what is being talked about. I'm empty. I'm a dry bone. I don't have it. I need it and I want it. I want, and I'm desperate. Please speak to me, God. I've been doing this for years and it's not enough. And I'm empty. Guys, come to the
the Lord and say, I'm empty and dull. You need to say, God, make me hungry. Make me hate the weight of my sin. Make me hate the flesh. Make me hate the things that offend me. Make me hate the things that prick my heart and make me look to this earth. Make me hate that. I don't want it because it's keeping me from you. Help me, Jesus. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to make you holy like Jesus. Make you look like him, Romans 8. I think I've said enough. Hallelujah. And there's more coming. God is calling us to a greater level of faith and trust. Yeah. Are you going to submit to him, or are you going to kick against the pricks? It's not a pleasant road. Why? Especially with our current environment, it's not going to be nice. It's not going to be pleasant. The political atmosphere is very volatile. We have... I mean, I'm not even going to get into it. But that's not the point. Are you still going to preach Jesus and Him crucified in the midst of the turmoil? Look, God has given you those circumstances so that you can preach Jesus. And people say, what do you have? I want that. That's the jealousy that they want, that they need, and they don't have it. Guys, let it increase in you. This is a passionate plea. Let it fire you up and say, I gotta have this. I gotta have this. I'm empty. I'm tired. Please. Look, if you don't wake up in the morning and throughout your day, there's at least one miracle, one way the Lord says, here, let me show you something. Guys, he always shows himself if we listen. Help us listen, oh God. Because we're so caught up with the things of this world. Oh God, help us listen. We're so stinking deaf. Oh God, help us. Jesus. Oh God, help us listen. Help us read your word and get in your get on our face for you. In Jesus' name, amen.